Okay. All right. Should we start? Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining the seminar today for the Geosciences and Geoenergy webinar. Uh, I'm Amir Palaban, uh, and uh, today I'm filling in for Hadi, who couldn't join due to his teaching obligations. Uh, so Sebastian and I will uh, host co-host the seminar today. Our speaker today is Professor Kemaljit Singh. Uh, for the audience of uh, the Porous Media Tea Time Talks, he doesn't need any introduction as he's been one of the co-founders of that seminar series that promotes young researchers. Uh, so Kemal is a professor at, uh, assistant professor at the Institute for Geoenergy and um, Geoenergy Sciences and Engineering at Harriet Watt University. He earned his PhD from University of South Wales in Australia, followed by post acquisitions at Max Planck and uh, Imperial College. So, so the list goes on. So I'm just trying to give you a, a, a snapshot. And his research uh, focuses on 3D imaging of multiphase flow in porous media. He's done some beautiful work and creative work with different uh, um, um, porous media, including termite uh, nests that I think we'll hear some uh, about today. So it's our pleasure to host Kemal today, and his talk would be 30 minutes followed by Q&A. And I guess, uh, Kemal, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amir, uh, for this kind introduction. And it's an honor and a great pleasure to be part of this fantastic webinar series. So today in this talk, I'm going to give a flavor of our research, which spans from uh, rocks to termiteness. Although it looks quite, uh, the, these topics, they look quite different. Hopefully, by the end of the presentation, I'll be able to show that there are some different sorry, uh, similarities in terms of porous media properties. So mostly, uh, my uh, research is focused on imaging of flow uh, using X-ray tomography, X-ray microtomography, which is similar to what you see in medical CT scanning. So for example, you have a ring-like structure there where you find X-ray source and detector. You can put an object on the top of this table, and then you throw X-rays on the object and you collect on the other side on a detector. It gives you 2D image. You can rotate the whole assembly and then take multiple images from different directions. And then you combine them together to get a 3D image. So conventionally, we have the fan beam geometry, but for our uh, research, we use cone beam geometry, which is shown in this figure here. So this is uh, X-ray source, and then we have a detector. And in our case, the sample, which rotates instead of the X-ray source and the detector here. So the difference between medical CT scanning and the um, lab-based sources, so is the resolution. Generally, we get about hundreds of micrometer in medical CT scanning, and the lab-based sources, we get about down to one micrometer resolution, which is sufficient to resolve pore spaces in the rocks. So this is a typical uh, scanner. This particular one is from our lab. Um, the good thing I like about the window, you can see through while doing the experiment, and it's quite spacious. You can uh, put the flow rig or flow operators uh, uh, inside the chamber there. So another configuration we can have is the parallel beam geometry in which generally you find this one at the uh, synchrotron facilities. The good thing about that, the time resolution, you get uh, about one 3D image in one second or so. Uh, while in the lab-based scanner, the same image you can get in hours. So when you're doing dynamic processes, imaging of multi-phase flow. So we generally go to synchrotron-based sources there. So this is a um, very typical image from uh, tomography we can get. So this is uh, about five millimeter in diameter and you can stitch together to get the larger sample. And then we, we can also get, this is a low resolution image. We can zoom into and do local tomography and we can resolve the pore spaces nicely. So mostly we do a uh, flow experiments. So in that case, we put our sample in a flow cell which we call um, core holder. Uh, in this particular case, it's made of carbon fiber, which is almost transparent to X-rays. So uh, also it can uh, withstand high pressure, high temperature conditions. Uh, so we use this uh, type of core holder for multi-phase flow experiment, which you, I think you all know that has many different applications, uh, significance in, for example, CO2 storage, oil recovery, and also to understand the uh, contaminant transport if you have a fuel spill there. So these multi-phase flow, uh, it can be impacted by many different parameters. So one of the most important one is the wettability of the system. And you can find the concept of wettability in natural settings or many industrial settings. For example, if you want to make your 
um, clothes are rainproof. So you want to make it hydrophobic so that water doesn't go into the fabric. So generally, what we, we characterize this variability uh, by con contact angle. Uh, for example, if you have a solid surface here, and then you put a droplet on the top, and the tangent it makes at the three-phase contact line, you can get the contact angle, this one here. If it's less than 90 degree, we call it wetting phase, wetting surfaces. And in some disciplines, it's called hydrophilic uh, surfaces. Or if it's more than 90, it's called non-wetting, or we can call it hydrophobic surfaces. Sometimes you, you can have hydrophilic surfaces, but uh, because of the nanoscale roughness, this shows uh, or behaves as a hydrophobic surface. You make droplets, and this you can see in some of the plants where the uh, the rainwater makes a droplet and it's useful for for the plants because the droplet can run off and it can clean the dust out of the uh, leaf so i'll show one example how it impacts the flow in our rocks but mostly the presentation the first part of the presentation is about looking into how variability can impact the fluid flow in porous milk and we will look mostly in two phase flow uh, in porous milk system so we'll start with the simple case, uh, the water wet case. In this case, we had a uh, carbonate rock, which is called it's, it's a cotton sample, uh, which is, comes from a small village in the UK. Uh, we completely fill this or saturate to this water, and then we start injecting non-wetting phase into it. Uh, we did this time resolve imaging a diamond light source with a resolution of about three micrometer, and the time resolution was 38 seconds in this case. But nowadays, we can uh, do the same experiment in second, one second or a few seconds. So now, let's say the uh, media is fully, uh, this rock is fully saturated with water, and we inject uh, oil in this particular case as a non wetting phase. And you can see the big jumps happening here and there. So this is the characteristics of uh, drainage process, which is controlled by throat sizes. You can also see sometimes uh, uh, droplet formation which happens because of the roof snapper processes. But what we were interested in, we were interested in looking into the imbibition process when you reverse the whole process and then you start injecting uh, water from the base. Just want to mention that we are only showing oil here. Uh, the the uh, water is transparent, the rock is transparent. So you can clearly see the difference between the two behaviors from drainage to imbibition that we don't see big jumps anymore. And also, we see some sort of trapping, so it's an irreversible process. We see some sort of trapping. We don't see big jumps because the process is now controlled by the pore sizes, and mostly it moves from one pore to the other pore. And this is the image you see on the left side. It's a final saturation after complete imbibition. So different colors here, they show different disconnected components of oil. You can't actually move it unless you change the flow rate, you can increase the flow rate or change the surface property. For example, you can inject surfactant in that. I, I actually intentionally put a, a picture on the right-hand side to show our initial efforts decades ago to characterize our interest in characterizing non wetting phases or the clusters, uh, trap clusters. In this case, it was mostly destructive to think you dissolve the rock. But nowadays, because of the tomography, we can get the same information non-destructively and we can use the sample for different processes. Another thing, because we it's a, it's a dynamic process we have captured, we can zoom into and we can look into how these droplets are forming. For example, this is the oil water again is not shown here. And we can focus on what's happening in this throat so that the uh, snap off occurs and the trapping occurs in this pore. So we can zoom into throat, for example, here. And yellow in this case now it is shown oil and the blue is water. And as because it's a non wetting phase, the oil, it makes its bulging inside. And the outer side here is a brine, we call it wetting layers. With time, as you keep injecting, the water pressure increases and these layers swell. And when the point comes, there's no touch uh, on the surface, solid surface, we get a pressure disequilibrium and we get the disconnection because of the snap off here. So we can, we can uh, calculate this pressure so that we can relate this pressure disequilibrium. We, uh, did quite a lot of calculation with the curvature mapping. And from young Laplace equation, we were able to get the pressure inside the pores, local pressures. So further information I've given in this paper, I've cited this one here. So you can uh, get this, uh, more information regarding the time scales and also pressure disequilibrium there. 
But then we went one step back. We said, okay, maybe we can get more information uh, by doing some simple calculations. In this case, what we did, we took the pore space and converted into the pore and throats using this pore network model. We didn't use the model for simulation, it just for the representation and getting the characteristics of the pore throat geometry. And then we put our uh, non wetting phase on the top, oil in this case, uh, from the dynamic series. So it gives us a quite rich information uh, from the pores and throats that are involved with this displacement processes and where it can snap off. So this is an uh, example from a small subset. And we did analysis on the complete data set and on the uh, time series. We took about 200 images and then we resolved those things and put the pore network on the top of it. So, but before analyzing, we simplified our system. So what we did, we, uh, we used the concept which was introduced by Linomo in 80s. So for example, if you have a geometry like that, and one throat is filled with oil, so we call it I1 configuration of fluid. And then if it's two are filled, we call it I2. If it's with three, then it's I3. And I'll put one example here. Let's say it's I3 configuration in this pore and I1 in this. So when we keep injecting water, this is the yellow shows the oil as a non wetting phase. The two things can happen. Either you can have pore filling event and this pore gets empty, or you can have wetting layer expansion as I shown in the previous video. And then you can have snap off here. In that case, this uh, oil can be trapped in this pore. So what we looked into, we looked into the first aspect ratios, which is the ratio of the radius of this pore to the throat where the movement is happening or the pore filling event is happening. So this is plotted in this in blue color. What it shows here, the histogram of all the pore filling events, the aspect ratio for the pore filling events in this particular geometry. And you can see mostly the events happen less than two, mostly aspect ratios of 1.5 or something very similar to that. And when we looked into snap off, uh, including the trapping, we got the threshold, which is close to two. And we did the similar thing for I2, I3 events. And snap off threshold was very close to two. And mostly the events happen less than two. But you can also see there are some events which are happening more than two, which is because our time resolution, resolution is not sufficient to tell whether, let's say, this pore is getting emptied, whether it was pore filling or it was snap off, then it moves as I1 event. So there are some sort of uncertainty in I2 and I3. But with the better time resolution, we hopefully we can get this solved. But the good thing was that that we got threshold which is close to two, and which is consistent with the theoretical concepts uh, from the previous literature. So we were happy. We were very happy that it matches the three D observation matches very well with the theory. So we also did some correlations. Exactly same thing that I showed before. Now we put into the correlation so that we see which parameters are mostly correlating. For example, in this case, this is the aspect ratio for the snap off for I1 event, this particular geometry. And we look into the correlation. If it's a zero, it's uh, not correlating at all. If it's one or minus one, it's uh, correlating perfectly. And we can see there's a, a very strong correlation for I1, I2 with aspect ratio. But with the pore, pore radius, throat radius, shape factor of throat we looked into, and also the coordination number, there are some some sort of correlation, but not as strong as with the um, uh, aspect ratios. So this is actually from one experiment. I must mention this. So we need more experiments so that if we want to generalize, if we want to see the similarities in that. So we conducted one experiment in, in February before the lockdown uh, on a sample sandstone, uh, Bentheimer sample. So we analyzed the data and we would like to see if we can get some sort of similar results on the same uh, on a different rock in the in the same sample so in the same experiment we found some unexpected events uh, for example if you have an oil sitting in this pore throat geometry here and in the next time step you inject keep injecting water and the oil moves out of it now the snap off didn't occur because if snap off was occurring in the throat it would trap the oil in the center of the pore space not a complete pore filling happened. Otherwise, we wouldn't see anything. We, what we see here, we see uh, a trapped oil in the side of the pore, on the corner of the pore. 
what we did, we looked into the grayscale images. We thought, okay, we can get some more picture. And we saw the oil sticking into the geometry here. It looks like a small pocket. And one may argue that this is a, another pore and we can have another snap off. Then we looked into our data. This looked like a part of the same pore, which is expanding, but also which will give us confidence that the trapping actually occurred outside the pore here. So this bulging is occurring outside. If it was a, uh, like traditional snap off, the oil would have sit, like sit inside this pore. Then we went uh, one step back. We looked into this grayscale image and the oil was sitting like this. One thing was very clear, the contact angle, uh, although the whole system contact angle was about 45 degrees, but here we clearly see the contact angle through water is more than 90 degrees. So this can only happen if you are pinning the interface. And interfaces can pin two different ways. Either you have roughness or the chemical uh, the composition of the rock is different at this particular location. But uh, we have 99 point uh, calcite. So this we are assuming of, that this is mostly related to the roughness and due spinning. So we wanted to explore this further by we, want, we wanted to support this, our hypothesis that this snap of occurs with the pinning of the interfaces. So we ran a few simulations. We took another case, very similar. Oil is sitting there, it moves in the next step, but leaves behind the oil on the side. And we ran uh, simulations. It's, uh, the simulation run by Mosaib Shan from Imperial College London. So we, what we did, we put the 45 contact angle on the, on the pore space, but we don't see any trapping. Then what we did, we selected, we knew that something is happening here. We put a patch and we changed the contact angle in that particular patch. We gave 60 degree and the rest 45 degree, uh, but we don't see any trapping there again. Then we increase the contact angle of that patch here and we made it 70 and we see, we already start seeing the trapping occurs. We increase the contact angle and then we can see the trapping again occurs. So this, this was very nice that we could uh, resolve this problem that why we have the snap off and why we see the interfaces pinning here. Uh, I would like to mention uh, that the, all the data set I was shown for the dynamic imaging, they, it's available online uh, on the BGS server. Uh, and some of the data sets are available on Masha server from digital off portal. So you can download this data set if you want to validate your models. And also, if you want to explore further the physics of these fluids for drainage and inhibition processes, if you find any difficulty, please uh, contact me. I can help you with that. And this is okay. One data set. Hopefully, by within a few months, we'll be able to put the second data set on these servers. Okay. So so far, we have looked into the case where we have water wetting case, uh, hydrophilic case. What we wanted to see, we wanted to explore what's the a factor of variability, we change the variability systematically. So we did very simple experiments in this case. We had uh, our sample holder and we filled it with beads and fully saturated with oil. And then we injected brine water from the base and imaged at the ESRF with a time resolution of about two seconds. And then we repeated these experiments by changing the variability systematically from 20 degree 265. So we, we did a range of experiments. So these, these are the examples of two contact angles here, one below 90 and one above 90 degree. So what you see here is a 3D sample um, was, uh, with the oil inside it, but you, you see only the vertical cross section. And uh, this is filled with oil now. And again, on the right, it's uh, filled with oil. We start injecting brine from the base. And we looked into uh, how the interfaces are migrating. And you can see here, it's a very compact front, leaving behind almost no oil in the porous media. And on the right hand side, you see a ramified front, leaving behind quite a lot of oil behind the front. This is again, uh, the same thing, but in 3D, uh, but different color, they show the different time steps of water injection. This is all water. And again, 3D shows the same thing. We have more compact front for 75 degree contact angle and a ramified front with a lot of finger formation for 125. And the quantitative information showed the same details here. We had a front area as expected in this case, we'll have a higher front area compared to that. And second thing what we had is the oil saturation because it's a mostly flat front 
we would expect we could we we obtain the final saturation within one, one pore volume and this is what you see here one pore volume we get to the final saturation which is almost nothing in there because there's no trapping now this is probably the highlight of uh, of this study to combine all the experiments together so we have here plotted the contact angle versus the residual saturation in the 3d system in blue color and michelle jung did experiment with 2d geometry like that and we put on the top of the our experiment uh, this red color is the 2d geometry although the saturation uh, is different in both the cases but the shape of this uh, transition is, is very similar so we get no trapping in this region but we see a lot of trapping in this region the interesting point here is that the transition okay doesn't exactly occur at 90 we have a range of con contact angle between 90 and 120 where we have the transition here so which means if it's in more than 90 degree you are in the domain of um, drainage process but you would still see the flat front and no trapping in this case so what's happening in this mostly the processes occurring are mostly uh, cooperative for example the one interface come from this side second from this and they merge or you can also see touch event which means like the interface is moving this way before the jump happens it touches an obstacle in front of it but on this side we see a hinge jump which we also call it burst uh, as long when it um, overcomes the threshold it jumps to the pore next pore so, so these are actually uh, uh, explained great in detail by Stefan Berg with 3D imaging. Well, this is all the same cartoon that I showed on this direction here. So this is what uh, we I've showed here. Uh, the transition is only for uh, when you have a homogeneous system with a glass bead which are of similar size. But once, as soon as you change the system, you make it more heterogeneous, you start to see the effect on fluid flow. For example, here we mix the bead sizes. We put two different bead sizes, and clearly we can see the front is favors the smaller pores because of capillarity. And here we change the system, uh, although the contact angle in all the system is very similar. And what we see here, more trapping in sand because we have roughness, we have more heterogeneous system. So, but what we need, we need more research in this domain. We want to also explore how it behaves in rocks. But the challenging part in the rocks is how to really systematically change the variability. So we still need more work in this direction. Okay, so then we made the system more complex, which is more relevant for petroleum industry, looking into mixed wet systems. Uh, so for example, this is a cartoon of what is the process of happening in mixed wet. So from the source of oil is migrated to the current reservoirs. The reservoir generally the carbonate rocks they are water wet and the oil migrates into and as it's bulging inside this a non-wetting phase and along with the time because it has uh, surface active components like asphaltines as are there so they can get deposited on the grains where the oil is touching so it can change the wettability of those particular places and the rest of the places they stay water wet so this when when you start injecting water to displace water to recover oil sorry uh, you will face then mixed wet conditions. This is what we wanted to test. And we did drainage experiment first. And this is all oil shown here. A rock and the water phase are shown like they are transparent. And we put some fatty acid in this decan phase. So what it does, it changes the wettability overnight. We, we can also, we also did some experiment with crude oil, but it needs more longer time or cooking of the crude oil to do the same effects. Now, after aging or after changing the wettability, we injected water from the base and looked into the distribution of the oil. So we obtained about 75% of recovery in this case. And then we compared under the same condition with water wet case. And you can clearly see the shape of the oil after residual saturation is obtained. It's quite different. So it's like mostly droplet-like structures. The recovery is about 50%. But in this particular case, we have mostly uh, plate-like structures. So we, we were interested in looking into details of this. So we zoomed into one of the particular regions in that particular experiment. So what you see here is small one or two pores. And then we 
uh, start the drainage. After drainage, you have oil uh, sitting in the larger pore space because it's a non-wetting phase. And then you have water sitting in the pore corners. And then the wettability changes. You inject water and you can see from the bulging of the interface, the water is non-wetting phase. And it leaves behind the oil layers. It could be in the corners or it could be sandwiched between two water bodies here. So this is the real uh, grayscale image. You see the corners, uh, the layers in corner or between two water bodies, initial brine and the invaded brine. So this is clearly different from water wet system because in water wet system, we have the oil sitting in the middle of the pore bodies. So these, uh, these layers, which were conceptually known and used in models. So we were happy to visualize for the first time in the rock geometry, real shock geometry. And the, 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 the layers, they are connected actually. This one thing is different from the water wet system here is these are connected layers. And if, if you keep injecting water or keep increasing the pressure of water, these uh, layers will drain. The oil will keep producing, which is not the same in the water wet case. We get almost after one pour volume, we get the residual saturation. Okay, so this, this is about uh, the wettability scenarios I want to discuss. We did quite a lot of experiments uh, with three phase flow. Alessio did lots of experiments where we see these sort of uh, layers uh, of oil, depending on the wettability. In this case, we had water wet system. We could see the layers between the gas and the water phases. But today I'm gonna keep it the whole talk to two phase flow. And okay, so now next topic is the exploring the termite nest. Now it looks quite different, a dramatic shift from what we just discussed. Uh, the You might have seen this in televisions or in real. Uh, these termites, they can make huge houses. Uh, generally, the, uh, there are more than 2,000 types of termite nests. And uh, out of these, only two dozen, they are destroying the woods and houses. The rest of the nests, they are highly social animals. So they, they interact with each other. They make houses which can be seven meter high. So another fascinating thing about them is they are blind and they still can make this. They can communicate with each other. But they can still make this structure. They communicate with the chemical signals. They can be vibration signals. So a lot of biologists for decades, they were interested in studying this termite nest. Uh, the reason for that, for example, if you have a termite nest like this here and it's a cartoon and this is the center of the termite nest. If you look into the temperature of the air outside the nest, depending on the country where the nest comes from, uh, it can be from 15 degree, can fluctuate to 30, 35 degree. But inside the nest, it stays very stable within plus minus two degree centigrade. So they, biologists, mostly they're interested in knowing how these structures control the temperature. With the motivations, if we learn it, we can design energy efficient buildings. The second thing actually people believed, all these structures, you can't actually have the, the pores, nothing, they are not connected. So nothing passes through these walls, which didn't make sense to us because there's millions of termites living under there. And if they're producing carbon dioxide, they, it has to be exchanged. So we, we were looking into these problems. We made collaboration with people from France and what they did, they supplied us samples from two different countries in Africa, from Senegal and from uh, Guinea, which are like about 1,000 kilometers apart. So we had two different sets of samples, and we did uh, imaging with medical CT scanning to look into the structures of their, uh, where yellow shows where the termites move, and the red shows the solid surfaces. So what we were interested in looking into, uh, how the walls of the nest, they look like, what the microstructure of these walls are. So we took samples from the outer side, inner side, many different portion of the nest, from both the nests from different countries, and put it into our scanner for micro scale imaging. And we were very surprised by the results we got. Uh, here, what you see in an image from Senegal, and this is the 3D image of the same sample. So blue shows the larger pores, what you see in the black here, and they are surprisingly connected to each other in all the samples. So we were interested actually how these pores are formed, different types of pores are formed. And then we were looking into the videos then, what, what's happening actually here, termites, they collect material around what they find like soil. They put into their mouth and then they put the saliva in it uh, to make it like a cement. 
and then they deposit these pallets, different pallet together. So these structures, they are the part of the same pallet. They com they're compacted feature of the soil with saliva in it as a binding agent. But you, when you put different pallets together, the space in between the pallet is the larger pores. So the larger pores, they were not intentionally made. They came as the packing geometry problem when you put different pallets together. So we wanted to know if there's any uh, benefit of these larger pores to termites. So we did a lot of different simulations on it. And what turned out to be, as we can expect, the pump build is quite large because of the connected larger pores. So if there's any wind blowing outside the nest, and then it can easily penetrate and can ventilate the nest. But if there's no wind outside, then diffusion kicks in and these larger pores, they allow the diffusion, diffusion to happen and CO2 can be exchanged with the outer atmosphere. Another thing that we, we okay, the one thing is obvious, if you have larger pores, they can give more insulation to the material, to the inside of the nest. One thing also what we were curious, let's say if rains, what happens in that case? For example, in Senegal, it rains less, but in Guinea, it quite a lot, it can rain quite a lot. So we put, we took our sample and we injected water on the top. And what you see white, it's all water here. And uh, if you, depending on how much water you can, we, you can inject on the top. And it's a water wet system, but you can expect the water is sucked into the smaller pores. This is what, what happens. But when we injected quite a lot of water on the top, what we found, the water doesn't go into the larger pores here. Either it gets trapped, it doesn't go there because you need higher water pressure, or because we were scanning after a couple of hours, it got drained while we were scanning. So in any of the scenarios, uh, it was obvious that these larger pores, they get empty very soon after the rain stops, which is very useful. As soon as the rain stops, they can, uh, the nest can vent start ventilation. So this was the um, uh, the findings that we got from our study. It was a like a hobby project, but now we are slowly moving towards making the major effort for for getting uh, for, for exploring it in detail. But the idea now is to do simulation on the larger part of the nest and combine the small scale features in that ventilation. We need to control. We need to add on ventilation. We need to at different scenarios of temperature. Another thing which is very important, thermal conductivity and the heat capacity, then different materials can react differently. So we are working on this and hopefully soon we'll have some nice results on the temperature conditions. But we were happy that our study, um, okay, first of all, we were happy that we got managed to publish it, but also we were happy that uh, it got a lot of media attention um, in different newspapers and the forums. But we are also more happy that uh, we got invitation to uh, present these results in public event and in which we showed our results. And also uh, thanks to Hannah and Sebastian for uh, printing this. Yes, so what we, we gave them a 3D uh, image and we printed the structure inside. It was uh, quite useful because people could touch it and can see how the features, how the channels are inside. And you know, what we found, it's very easy to connect with people because the topic, they could see the nest, I think they've seen in um, daily lives or in the television, they could see and they could relate and they were trying to find the answer how we can learn more science and we can use it in, um, let's say, designing energy efficient buildings. So this was the part of Team Vargas and Ali when we did this public event. It was a really great experience for us. So uh, this, the last slide here is we, we are doing one more project led by Guillaume. Uh, it's a very interesting problem, again, like termite nests. So they, like a country like Fiji, and there are many other countries, there are some ants. And what they do, they go into woods and they hunt around for seeds. And there's only six types of seed they are interested in. And when they find this seed, they go high up and they look for the cracks and they put the seed there. And then what they do, they put nutrition, to the seed, they protect the seed from damaging, and the plant comes out of it. And generally, you have plant with a very small stem and with the leaves, but the ants, they know the stem is going to be coming from this seed, it's got a big stem. And if you cut the stem, it looks like this. This is a medical CT scanner, a scanning image. 
all this white color shows the plant structure and the black hair shows the open channel inside the plant and they all galleries they are connected uh, so what interesting thing is this this is called ant plant symbiosis for the reason because ants they grow it but in exchange plant gives space for living inside it's like a house for the ants it protects ants from the enemies it's okay but the second thing if you measure the temperature they are very stable so um, the, the the question here is uh, how do the plant structure can control the temperature is it because of the structure itself or the problem can be complex because the plant has moisture in there so the moisture can evaporate uh, and because of the evaporation because of the latent heat it can cool down so we are doing some study on this uh, ant plant symbiosis on different types of plants for example these different this is from fiji quite big sample so we did medical ct scanning now we are running uh, simulations on this with this i would like to uh, wrap my talk so what I've shown is here is like 4D imaging, uh, which is the time resolved 3D imaging with the recent, uh, recent advances in imaging fast with a higher resolution. We are able to capture the pore scale processes uh, very nicely. What we can also do, we can uh, extract quite a lot of different parameters, variability we can characterize. I didn't have a chance to show uh, the codes and also the results uh, for characterizing the variability from the images itself. We can do the curvature analysis, fluid connectivity, pore throw properties. And we did only one data set, but now we are doing more experiments on this. The second thing, like in the last part of the talk, you've seen all these tools, what we have developed for subsurface flow, for imaging, for running simulations, we can use it uh, for different system like termiteness. So we almost opened a new corridor for, for the scientists in working on that field and also for the ant plant symbiosis. So where are we going now further? So we are expanding into more complex problems, for example, upscaling. So we our next project is looking into multi-phase flow, uh, um, sorry, multi-scale, multi-phase flow imaging. And also we're looking, we, we're going to start a major project on CO2 storage. And there's also one project we started on hydrogen storage. Uh, Zaid, our PhD student, has joined our team who's going to look into this. And also we hopefully will produce more data set and we will be able to upload and share with public so that people can validate their simulations and can, can learn more physics of this phenomena, complex phenomena. With this, I would like to um, thank or acknowledge our QCC SRC Center at Imperial College who funded me for five years. And big thanks to Martin Blunt for supporting me on those five years. It was very fruitful discussions. And then always big thanks to different teams as I've shown, fluid flow experiments, termiteness, and plant symbiosis. And also great thanks to uh, teams from ANU, Australian National University, Adrian, Tim, and Mark, who got me into tomography, and Ralph and Marco, who got me into 4D imaging with synchrotron. And last but not least, special thanks to our technical staff members and experimental officer. They always work in the background. They don't come into the publications, uh, which we tend to forget them. But I would like to highlight their contribution because without them i think this study would have been possible and now i thank you for your patience and for listening to me and i'm happy to answer your questions i hope i managed to finish thank you time. very much <laughs> you absolutely did thank you very much uh, for this great talk kamal um the number of questions have come through I start with the first one which is a very very practical one um from Larry, very neat 3D images. Oh, okay. software did you uh, thank use? you, Larry, for the question. So, so lots of the research what you've seen in the first part with the three or four D imaging, I've used uh, commercial software, a Viso. But there's a, a one part where I showed the glass bead experiments uh, with the different variabilities. I use an open software called Drishti. It's uh, uh, developed by Australian National University. You can download it. And this, you can you can run uh, all the four network. You can load it on this. I did it, but I didn't show it today. And also, you can run time series on those software. That's software. So it's an open software. And some parts which I didn't show, I also use image. But Aviso was the major software I used for most of the research today. Thank you. I hope Larry is <laughs> taking note of the free software package as well. Uh, here's a question from Martin Blunt, one of your um, collaborators. Uh, great talk. Do you see to ex 
do you expect to see similar displacement processes in fibrous porous media with higher porosities in fuel cells, surgical masks, Yes, I think it, 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 Thank you, Martin, for the question. Yes, it depends, again, um, uh, on the pore sizes. Porosity can be high, but the pore sizes can be narrow. So it really depends on the pore sizes. Uh, again, as I showed in the glass bead experiments, so if you change the pore sizes, we, the displacement pattern changes. If you have homogeneous beads, and then we were seeing very nicely all the experiments running smooth, and then as soon as we introduce heterogeneity, then things can change. And also the second thing is wettability. So if you change the wettability, things can, can change there. But yes, uh, the learning, what we are learning as fundamentals, they are applicable as, uh, as long as the system falls into this and system falls into the capillary. capillary for example, in the fuel cell, their pores are tinier, not like large out of capillary range. Thank you. Um, I'm going to follow up sneakily with a question of my own um, on Martin's question. And what is really inspiring is how you look at different materials and how you understanding the biological materials help us um, possibly to engineer better, better say, building stones, for example, or materials for um, um, constructing buildings. How would we, do you have any idea how we could go about this, how we can take the learnings from the imaging, the processes, be it you know, imaging surgical mask or termite nest to engineer better materials. For yeah, sure. I think the, yes, I think absolutely. So what we are trying to do, we are trying to do, learn the fundamentals of the processes. Uh, again, like Martin, I, uh, I forgot to mention that uh, the fibrous materials, we can now also have more pinning of the interfaces. So that means uh, we, we have more complex interfaces and if the fertility is different. But yes, it's best to answer your question. Yes, if we understand the fundamentals correctly, then we can apply on different uh, problems. The idea is here to do experiments and then develop the simulation tools, which can repeat this experiment pro processes with different variability, let's say with different pore sizes, different roughnesses. And then once our simulations are ready, we can apply on any system. Because let's say surgical mask, we have airflow, but what we want, we want, we don't want the droplets to go out. So we have like a two-phase uh, system uh, where wettability can play a role, uh, fibrous material can play a role. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure that we, once we get to the stage, to at that stage when we have the full complete knowledge at the fundamental scale, uh, fundamental processes, we can apply. So hopefully this is the hope. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a question that comes in two parts from Fazal Mezai. Um, great presentation. I have a question about the limitation of X-ray CT in multiphase flow. The X-ray CT system may have a limitation in contrast, especially for light elements. And the question continues. So I'd like to know your thoughts about hybrid imaging, possibilities to use neutron imaging jointly with X-ray CT. Thank you, Fazal, Thank for, you. for this question. Um, so, so you can have uh, different scenarios. For example, you already mentioned you can combine neutron tomography with CT scanning, but you can also use, let's say if you got a different, like uh, when you don't have sufficient contrast in the system, then you can combine with grating, you can also use phase contrast imaging. So there's many examples in soft tissue engineering uh, where you use phase contrast along with absorption contrast to get, uh, get the details of the sample. Yes, what well, people are doing, already doing these things for different materials. And I haven't seen much into our discipline. Mostly we control because let's say we have porous rock. Rock is quite high density material. And then we tune our phases. And uh, in this case, we have to dope uh, our uh, fluids to get the contrast. But yes, uh, I've seen, uh, for example, if you look into Virle's uh, talk, uh, she, she has shown uh, quite a lot of different uh, uh, combination, not only this, uh, the phase contrast imaging, you can also combine this with XRF, so you can get uh, elemental analysis on it. So this sort of stuff you can also add on. Okay. And I think the first part of the question was, there was another thing which I missed, I probably this question. Or did that, I no, that, that was it, that was it. It was just a long, long question. <laughs> um, again, so some, some more practical questions. Um, Vijita asks, thank you for the nice presentation. What's the minimum resolution that you were able to 3D print the termite nest? Okay, so the because of these channels are quite large, so we were not we were not restricted by the resolution. Uh, I, I think the resolution of the scanner is 100 
uh, micrometer. Sebastian, correct me because it comes from your lab. <laughs> if it's um, if I'm wrong, I so, think it's so about hundred. Yeah, we can go down to, to roughly 100 micrometer on the can resolve features found to of that are 100 meter micrometers apart. In the 3D um, now I remember what I missed uh, uh, in the in the first part of the talk where there was uh, about uh, mm, what we miss in the 3D imaging or 4D imaging. So let's say the time resolution is uh, our limited by one second so far. So there are some processes which are so fast we can't do 4D imaging. So that's why I'm trying to remember. I, I was trying to uh, think that there was one point and this is uh, we let's say do you doing 2D micro model experiments, and then in the micro model experiment you have the facility to use high resolution camera. That means you can resolve those drainage processes very nicely. But for us, the let's say one hinge jump occurs, then there's the 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 resolution imaging resolution one second doesn't help because these are millisecond processes. So these hand jumps like Stefan has also seen also my uh, videos has shown that once it jumps it depending on the pressure equilibrium it can jump to several poles altogether. So we don't see the dynamics in between. If we want to see if there's inertia playing role then we don't have any options. Uh, we have to rely on the two D imaging scheme. So that's that's also another limitation of three D imaging. The four D imaging. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Razul. He wonders, this is a again, nice presentation. I just should add um, there are many, many very positive comments well, coming you. through, <laughs> congratulating you to a great talk. So Razul says, nice presentation. How did you change the wettability in your experiments to study the effect of wettability? So I showed two different types of experiments. So the, the first one was systematically changing the wettability. Um, again, it was slightly easier for us because we were using spheres. And spheres, so you can ch change the variability. Either you can use different material as long as there's no other effect, for example, surface roughness. We use basalt in one case, we used glass in another case. And we, in one case, if one, when we wanted to have very high contact angle, we coated with OTS. And that gave us like 165 contact angle. But we also find that if you, fill the glass beads uh, first with, let's say, oil, then it's oil wet system. And to make it water wet, we, we cleaned it properly with prania. So that gave us contact angle of 20 degree. And also at the, for, the, for the very last contact angle, what we did 20 degree, we used, we didn't use the same system. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. This is air and water. Yes. So this is one challenging part to, what my interest was to get to that Part, typical part with the low range contact angles, as you can see from Zhu's uh, uh, publication, uh, Zhao, I think, uh, from Ruben's group. We see this uh, pendular rings going in front of the main front. And this is the most difficult part in 3D imaging. So control the contact angle and how to image those things. But mostly I control this way, we control this way the variability. But in the second experiment, what we did, we did drainage with an oil when we when I was talking about the mixed fat conditions. So we use oil and we mix a very small amount of fatty acids in it. So after drainage, it goes as a drainage and overnight it changes the variability of the system, only places where it's touching the rock surface. So there are two different experiments. I hope you got the answer, but I'm happy to uh, follow for this, you know, do follow-up discussions. So you can send me an email. Right. So Soren has, Soren Pop has a question. Hi, Soren. Um, nice talk. You mentioned upscaling among your future plans. Could you be more specific? How would you use imaging and which scale would you like to reach? Oh, thank you, sir. Sorry for this question. So uh, upscaling so far has been done on a different sample. So this is one way of doing it. Uh, what you can do, let's say you take a long, large sample, so let's say one and a half inch core, and then you take let's say if it's a very heterogeneous sample. If it's a homogeneous sample, then it's slightly easier to do upscaling, as I think you already know. If it's, a, let's say, carbonate, so there are two different ways of doing it. So first we can, let's say, look at large image of the rock. We identify different areas where we have more heterogeneous system, and then pick uh, core or drill the samples from different areas, and then choosing some very carefully there where we have different heterogeneity. And then we can create two-phase flow in those by experiment and simulation and then combine them together, hopefully by machine learning. But second thing which we are trying to do is doing multi-scale imaging and with the same sample. 
uh, there's no result, so I can't really say it works or not. But uh, hopefully within a year, I can I can be able to give you more details on it. Once this multi-scale imaging, which we are planning uh, along this uh, uh, Sebastian, uh, and with entries also, we're working on the project inside. Uh, if it works, then we will be able to image within the same sample, and we can then solve very easily, not easily, nicely, the uh, the upscaling a heterogeneity problem. So it's a work in progress, sorry. But it's it's a very genuine question, and it's a, it's, a, it's the most complex or uh, problem of this uh, decade, probably. Let's say for the coming decade, which hopefully we can solve in this decade. Okay. There's there's a plan for for 2021 to 2030. Then for you, we've all heard heard you. In 20. <laughs> <laughs> we come back. I hope the lockdown goes down soon, then we can start working. <laughs> um, Mohamed has, has a question. Wonderful talk, Kamal. Any insights on how to study coupled THMC processes, thermal, hydraulic, mechanical, chemical processes, using synchrotron imaging? What would be the most challenging issues in terms of practicalities of the experiments? Um, uh, thank, thank you, Mohamed, uh, for asking the question. I'm just trying to think. He says THMC. Uh, so it's, it's thermal, a, it's thermal? coupled thermal, hydraulic, mechanical, chemical yes. processes. Okay, so I wasn't aware of that. Yes, you can, you can do I think there's a, there are people already doing these things. Uh, so let's say, for example, there's a cell like the ESRF. If I'm not wrong, please correct me, ESRF people. So it's called Hades. You can, you can do these processes. It can allow for uh, flow through. And also you can uh, do, do mechanical uh, stresses on the same. So, they, but the sample size is limited, only five millimeter window, both sides. But I think the, in our department, people are already, uh, uh, lots of people are already developing this cell, uh, like Alma, uh, Helen, and also Gary. So hopefully in the future, we'll have our cell, but these cells, they already exist. But this is the one that I hear is very expensive. It's more than 200,000 pounds for the cell itself. So, uh, but yes, it exists, I, I know this one. Then you can then conduct in those, uh, cells experiments what you are interested in um, so it should be straightforward but the problem is only the sample size it's a five millimeter window uh, because of the you really want to achieve the high pressure high temperature conditions okay. i hope mom yeah. i think we can talk later if you if you really want this more information i can give you the details of the person who has this cell at esrf okay. please send me an email i can i can i can talk to you the porous media tea time talks <laughs> Thank you much. I think we've gone through all the questions here. So um, thank you again um, for the for the questions and to the audience for all the questions to come up. Excellent talk. And um, over to you, Amir, for some closing comments. Yeah, actually, uh, I had uh, I was waiting for all the questions to be over to ask another question uh, for myself. So you showed uh, this very nice uh, plot that you said that 2D and 3D, I guess that was re residual saturation. That was the same, sort of you were getting the same information from both. At least the trend yeah. was the same. So what you've done lots of uh, different experiments. I'm wondering you know, uh, where you would think there would be differences between 2D and 3D experiments. Okay, so I think uh, this, these are very simple experiments in the way because they are initially filled with the oil, let's say, and then you inject uh, water in it. Uh, we are missing, let's say, snap off in this process. I mean, like if you're in drainage imbibition, we might find the same a different behavior because in 2D, uh, we have pores and throat we can control in one dimension, but the other direction we can't do. Hopefully with the with 3D printing, we can do that. Then we find, can hopefully find the similarities. But I haven't done, to be honest, with the drainage imbibition experiment and compare them together. This is the done with a very simple system, having oil in it, changing the variability systematically, injecting with water. And then we're comparing this thing. We can have differences, for example, if you have a compact system, because in porous media, with the natural one, the grains are contact each other. And in the 2D geometry, we can't have that thing. Because, uh, because if you compact that, that means there's no permeability. And that's another thing where I think we can't really uh, have this uh, corner layer flow and things like this. So this yeah. is my, my opinion. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Thanks for the input. So with that, I think we are uh, at the end of the talk today. Thanks a lot, Kemal, for the fascinating talk. Thank um, you very much for having me here. Um, so next week, we'll have Giovanni, Professor Giovanni Bertotti uh, giving a talk on the geology of flow through carbonate rocks from fracture networks to pipogenic karsts.
Uh, so that will be December 3rd. Uh, looking forward to that. And with that, I think we are done. Yes, we're done. So thank you, everyone. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to Kamal. Stay happy, stay safe, and see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, Bye. for asking questions. Yeah.